Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll start with a opening statement from Dr. Postal, and then we'll accept your questions when, uh, when we get to that point. If you'll just raise your hand so we can call on you. We have uh, with us, uh, obviously, uh, our interim president, Dr. Greg Postal, uh, vice president, director of athletics, Tom Jurich, head <coughs> basketball coach, Rick Bettino, and our consultant, Chuck Smirt, with the compliance group. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this morning, the University of Louisville received a letter from the NCAA outlining the results of its investigation of our men's basketball program. From the start, UofL has accepted full responsibility for activities that took place, which we have characterized as inexcusable. We have been fully cooperative with the NCAA during all stages of the process and early on made the decision to self-impose penalties, which included a post-season ban, among other decisions in 2016. We've continued to cooperate with the NCAA throughout this whole process of investigation since that time, uh, including participating in a hearing before the Division I uh, Infractions Committee in Cincinnati recently, where we spent an entire day and had an opportunity to fully discuss the matter with the Infractions Committee and the Enforcement staff. Uh, we had an opportunity to tell our story and to discuss steps uh, that had been taken to prevent a matter such as this from ever taking place again. We anticipated the possibility that there would be additional penalties. Uh, however, uh, the results that we received today outline a set of penalties that we consider excessive and beyond what would uh, be seen, uh, in our opinion, in a case such as this. There has been a heavy toll uh, on the community, our fans, and on players who played no part in the activities which took place. And so because of this, it is our intent to appeal the penalties. Um, and at this point, I'll defer to my colleagues for further comment. We'll, uh, we'll take questions now. Uh, anyone? For Mr. Smirk, uh, did you expect this this kind of punishment, and what was your reaction when you when you saw it? The penalty exceeded our expectations. This was a significant case, but we believe the penalty was very, very significant. The severity of this penalty, we think, exceeds the severity of this case. So yes, we do we we did not expect this severe a penalty. Rick. What part of the penalty specifically is excessive? Well, uh, we believe, as the president said, we intend to appeal the penalties. We imposed penalties based upon what we thought were the guidelines submitted by, uh, directed by the NCAA in this type of case. So those, that's why we imposed a self a postseason ban, which obviously was very significant. We imposed scholarship cuts, which were very significant. The additional penalties imposed by the committee were the ones that surprised us, if you will. Chuck, uh, for any of the gentlemen who can answer this, the NCAA was very unclear about what games could be vacated uh, due to this. Do you all have a, uh, a better read on the as as the president indicated, we intend to vacate. We, we intend to appeal the penalties. One of those penalties is the vacation of records. We're still working through that, but at this time, we believe it could impact 108 regular season games and approximately 15 NCAA wins. Yep. Yeah. Okay. How's my question? Okay. I think pretty much Chuck's statement is the way we all felt. Other questions? Chuck, did ineligible players play? Well, again, in, in our response that was released publicly several months ago now, we indicated that the, if, if the vacation of records penalty was, was imposed, that that could impact you know, the number of games I just mentioned, 108 and 15. So, so that is, and the committee found that ineligible athletes competed. I might have assumed that 15 includes the championship games. 
That's correct. Again, if you'll uh, please raise your hand and be recognized just so we can keep it orderly. What have we got? Yes. Just to be clear, you guys are appealing all of this stuff or just well, I, you, the process is you appeal each specific penalty. So at, as we sit here today, we intend to appeal those penalties that the committee has imposed other than ones self-imposed, obviously, by the institution. Eric. So will you appeal based on any, is it based on the past NCAA practice or on anything you feel like they got wrong well, it's it's based again. This is we just got this information two hours ago, but we believe it will be based upon precedent, and that the severity. If you take the severity of the violations, which again are significant, but if you take the severity of the violations and then you add on penalties such as vacation, which could impact such a significant number of games, we believe that's excessive. Well, you know, for 35 some odd years, I've had a lot of faith in the NCAA um, and have reacted that way accordingly as a head basketball coach in the belief in their rules. I've thought in the, in the recent past, they've made some gr great adjustments uh, to the rules that have helped players along the way. I feel not like everybody here, not only is it unjust, unfair, over the top se severe, but I've lost, personally, I've lost a lot of faith in the NCAA and everything I've stood for for the last 35 years with what they just did. Now, that is a committee, so you can't hold everybody accountable for a committee's decision. So I'm going to put all my faith and all my beliefs in the appeals committee that they will do the right things uh, for the university, for the players, and for everyone else, because we felt... We sat down and made some very tough decisions uh, a year ago in imposing those penalties, and it did severely hurt our program. And none of us do not feel extreme remorse, regret, and everything that what went on inside that dormitory. Uh, we, we've said that many, many times. But this is over the top. It's, it's to the point where it's not even conceivable what I just read. It's not even conceivable, believable. So we, we, we have to just put all our trust and faith uh, that this is um, that the appeals will, will do the right things in arguing our case because we presented a very strong case. And as you, as you probably could see from uh, the lawyer uh, that represented me, that not one time were they, were, were they questioned about a red flag, the enforcement committee. What was the red flag that you wanted him to see? Because it was not out on social media. Nobody... Players on my team were questioned, and they said they had no knowledge of it. And then they, they expected this one part from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning we did not monitor. I, I wish I could stay up that late at 64, but I cannot. Um, so, you know, I, I just feel we are devastated by the news. We are, um, all of us are. But that being said, moving forward, we believe we will win the appeal because it's right and it's just. And what went on was unjust and inconceivable. So we will put our trust in the appeals process. And we believe that everything we have done should have sufficed. And we think we'll come away um, totally intact with everything we believe in. Yes, sit back. Coach Matito, the NCAA was clear when they said that they believed you did not protect a healthy and safe environment for these players and these recruits. Talk about going forward. As going forward, how do you now face parents and potential recruits and say, I can do this? We've had the best recruiting class I've had in 16 years this year. Um, probably going to have even a better one next year. I don't think the parents believe in any of that. First of all, it's not an athletic dormitory. That's the first thing that must be corrected. It's not an athletic dormitory. Secondly, um, that dormitory probably has more security than any dormitory around. Uh, in polling so many people, I know my college basketball coach, and I polled over 30 other coaches, has your coach ever visited your dormitory when you were in college? 30 and 0 said no, he did not. Uh, I visit there once or twice a week. Am I there from 10 p.m. to 8 in the morning? I'm not. 
So uh, I, I think this is a matter of, in every department, uh, someone did the wrong thing, and he must be held accountable for it. But that has nothing to do with security going forward with parents. I'm just curious, in your own thought process, is that any time during this entire process, including today, have you considered leaving program? No, never one time. Pat. Uh, Mr. Smirk, my admittedly unclear understanding of NCAA appeals procedures, uh, will you appeal part of the procedure of the hearing and the ruling, or what exactly will be the basis of the appeal? What, what was faulty in your okay. view, other than just the, the, the okay. Under the process, you can appeal penalty and findings. So we, will, we would have to identify specific penalties that we would appeal. And as, as again, as we're sitting here today, if if this penalty collectively is too excessive, then we would probably appeal each individual component of the penalty in order to in order to get the objective that it was uh, excessive. Back. Uh, is there what's the timetable for this appeal? Is there a certain number of days you have to have it to them, and then once the NCAA has it, what's their their timetable for getting back to you and getting the resolution? Yes, that is, uh, the institution has about two weeks, 15 days, to notify them, uh, notify the NCAA of an appeal. The university then has 30 days to prepare a response. The Committee on Infractions has 30 days to respond. The institution has another 15 days to respond, and then a hearing date is scheduled. So we're looking at three months in, in, in back and forth with materials, and then a hearing date is scheduled. Yes, sir. When we talk about vacating games uh, that you played in the past, what kind of money are we talking about when it comes to regular season games and uh, individual uh, tournament games? V vacation by itself does not necessarily require forfeiture of funds. There is one of the penalties, as you have read, uh, says the university is supposed to return certain funds received from the conference. At this point, we're still trying to figure out what the impact of that would be. I, th I think we're just trying to figure that out at this point. Howie. For Mr. Smirk, if a uh, player is, is declared ineligible retroactively, how do you determine how many games he should have been suspended, or is he, is he ineligible for all the games that he played? The, the, the one, once a, a student athlete is ineligible, they retain that status until they're reinstated or their eligibility expires. This is for uh, Mr. Smirk. Did the NCAA, you feel, ultimately decide the monetary value wasn't weighted as much as maybe the actual acts that took place? I, I, I don't know that I heard what Dr. Cartwright said this morning, and I think that's what she said. Yes. Just, just to be clear, in terms of what defines an ineligible player, just those that were there at these parties, or, or how exactly does that work? Well, an athlete becomes ineligible either through a recruiting inducement, which is because they are a prospect, or a student athlete's call an extra benefit. So once once an athlete or a prospect receives a benefit, then they become ineligible at that at that point. Eric, one point I'm not quite exactly right. Said something effective that they had never seen a case like this before. Another, she indicated as the question before said that. Um, because of the acts, the dollar amount was less, and it was going to be considered at a certain level. Have you ever told them at any point you might be dealing with a different type, a set of interpretations than we might have seen before? I, I don't know about interpretations. I think that we heard what Dr. Cartwright said today that they that and one of the one of our points in our response and at the hearing was this is significant this was bad behavior there and the institution has been very contrite about that i think throughout throughout all of these press conferences in our response we have said numerous times this was bad behavior shouldn't have happened we've been very very contrite about that all that being said we also said that if you look at the value of these benefits compared with other cases, that we believe the value of the benefits should be the basis for the, for the, for the penalty. Dr. Cartwright talked more about the nature of the violations than the value of the benefits today. Yes, John. Uh, Mr. Smart, 
in the past, it seems that when a player has an academic violation or so forth, then they're ineligible for the whole season. But oftentimes, when extra benefits are concerned, they're only uh, ineligible for a certain number of games. They may rule they'll be three or four games. Do you expect that to be the case with, in regards to this to this ruling, or will that be is that further with your dealings with the NCAA? One of, as, as you have maybe read in our response, one of our basis is for for the vacation was not appropriate was the if these athletes would have gone through the restoration process at that time they would have been restored without loss of eligibility that's that's a point that we have made in the past and i anticipate we'll make again one of the points dr Charrett made was that the coaches are required to act with honor and dignity uh, does that fit an actual NCAA bylaw, or was that a committee interpretation? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what she was referring to. I she was referring to Coach McGee, but uh, I was just wondering if, if they were applying a standard that is actually in the rule book or a standard of behavior that is not necessarily... Coach McGee was found for unethical conduct, uh, and I, I, my guess is that's what she was referring to. Yes. Uh, this, this goes to the uh, get to the question of uh, contrition. Uh, Coach Patino, what exactly are you taking responsibility for in all of this? I'm not answering that question. Can you tell me why, sir? Because I don't want to at this point. Um, I take responsibility for this program, and leadership is about leading people the right way down the right path. And what you're alluding to is I've had 31 assistant coaches go on to become head pro coaches in the pros as well as assistant coaches in college. Some of the best leaders in the game have been under me. And one person did the wrong thing. So I'm not going to sit here and espouse any more on the, on the, uh, what I taught those 31 guys to be great leaders as well as the one person that did not do the right thing. So uh, I don't have enough time to talk to you about 31 guys and how great they are. Chase. Or uh, Mr. Smurf or Mr. Jurich, is there a ballpark? As I mentioned, I think we're still trying to, to sort through that. We, we, did, we just had this for about two hours. General reaction, we haven't heard from you yet. Your thoughts? Well, obviously, it's, it's, I'm disappointed. You know how important this program is to me and this university is to me, but uh, I didn't see this coming, Pat, to be perfectly candid with you. Uh, I thought we did everything above and beyond when we found out about this incident. Uh, my, I think my greatest disappointment is with the organization itself because we followed their guidelines to a T, even exceeded them in, in most pos positions. Uh, we were overly aggressive and penalizing ourselves. We wanted to make sure that we they knew that we would take this very, very seriously and be very, very responsible, not only as an athletic department, but as a university and a community. And I think we did all those things. Uh, you know, not one time did I ever hear about a red flag. And that's what I kept looking for. And uh, somebody as naive as me when it comes to social media, I've, I've learned in the last six months how, how strong that is. And to not have one of these incidents ever pop up on social media to me is unconscionable. It's, it's impossible in, the, in this day and age we live. So for us to be able to figure out how this could have been going on in a, in a building that we feel was so tightly secure, you know, obviously it did have some breaches, no question about it. We found that out after the fact. But it's a, it's a, it's a real disappointment to me and, and in the organization how they viewed this. Yes. Uh, Chuck, I think I read these, uh, these questions were handled by the subcommittee of the Committee on Infractions. Is that correct? Yeah, the, there's the, the Committee on Infractions is an entity of about, it's a panel of about 20, and then for each hearing, certain seven, there'll be seven members generally, so we had a panel of seven from the, from the total committee of 20. Do you know who they were? Yes, well, at, yes, because at, at the Committee on Infractions, we appeared before them. Jeff, Jeff listen, right? That, yeah, I think in your in your fractions report it lists out who those people are. Yeah, to be to be clear, if the 2013 national championship game is vacated, the banner comes down. 
Is that correct? The, uh, in the infractions report, it talks about the implications of, of any forfeiture, and it does says return, return of, of trophies, et cetera. Yes, sir. Going forward, I'm curious about what kind of risk you might be taking it in this process. Is there anything in the appeals process that could result in worse penalties going forward? No. So you, there is no risk for the university to quit the challenge? The, the committee on infra the, the infractions appeals committee will not increase your penalty. Howie? Mr. President, what, uh, what was the process like to, uh, to decide to appeal? And, uh, and how was that discussed? And was that a quick process, an easy process, or was it, was it given as soon as you read it? You got to feel it. Well, I think it's important for people to note that we did receive this report at 9 o'clock this morning for the first time. So we've read through it. It's a long uh, report, probably 40 or 50 typed pages. So we've, we've done our best to assimilate the contents of this report, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, I think as everyone has described, the, the findings uh, that we received were far in excess of what we anticipated uh, and, and far in excess of what we consider to be fair and reasonable for the circumstances. And so on that basis, uh, we intend to appeal now. And in the days ahead, we have 14 days to think through in more detail exactly what that means and how that appeal will be crafted. That's why they give you time uh, to do that, because at this point, we've simply not had enough time to think through it at that level of detail. Gary. Uh, in, the, in the teleconference, they were saying that we leave it up to you all to determine the eligibility of the games and that sort of thing. But what if you come up with a list of games that you feel, a number of games you feel like is sufficient and they disagree? Well, the, the, I said, well, the university and the enforcement staff would, would go back and forth on that. So I'd... I believe we are in pretty good agreement right now with the with the enforcement staff on what games could be what games could be in play. Well, who hears or rules on the appeal? The same committee or no? There's an infractions appeals committee, which is a total different group. So they would not be in the pool, if you will, of the committee on infractions. Chase, this is for either Mr. Smart or President Postal. If the appeals process is denied, is there another avenue or route to challenge the findings outside maybe of the NCAA? Well, the, the, the NCA process is you appeal to the infractions committee, and that would be the last step within, within the NCAA. It would be final at that point. If you did With, within the NCA process, that's correct. Is there anything outside of the NCAA process? I, 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 do, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's the last step within the NCA process. Take a couple more, but uh, just for clarification, there was something mentioned by the NCAA that there seemed to be some kind of breakdown where the responsibility for oversight was delegated to assistants, but then the assistants told them they weren't aware they had that responsibility. Can you comment about that and what changes, if any, have been made as a result of that? None of that is true. We we all are responsible for. Uh, the actions of our basketball team, uh, certain, just like you delegate certain areas of recruiting and scouting, um, same things are done. We are all responsible for the actions of our players. And um, what was, there were parts there that we totally disagree with, and that's why we will appeal it. So your assistants did know they had that responsibility? All assistants have that responsibility as well as the head coach. How did the NCAA get a different uh, point of view? Well, we have, obviously, that's where we're going to appeals. I think, I think what you're referring to is in the infractions report, the committee had snippets of interviews, from uh, snippets of statements from different interviews, and they included some of those in there. That does not necessarily mean that we would agree with all those snippets from the interviews, but there was no finding that anybody on the coaching staff, other than the former director of ops, were, was aware of this so that's i guess the that that someone said something does not necessarily mean there was a finding to that effect so in any case this case or any case you're always going to have people who have different different beliefs on what was said and, and what they have i would but you have to look at what's the finding not necessarily what 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 different people said along the way so just just to clarify there was no finding that 
that any anybody knew what was going on other than McGee. Last question from Will Beck. For uh, Coach Patino, have you discussed the, the findings that were released today with, with the players that are in town, or do you plan to do that? Well, it doesn't affect them in any way, but I, I will discuss to them what I've told them all along, that every step along the way, if you see something wrong, immediately step up uh, so it, be, it doesn't become a problem going forward. It becomes a problem in the past that you can erase. And just as if you see something that's going on. And, and you have to understand, um, obviously, this gentleman is not from. Where are you from, by the way? Wave three, okay. The um, I guess he is from here. Um, you got you have to understand that in every situation, whether it's J.P. Morgan and someone in that organization has a problem, or a police chief has a problem with a sergeant, or a fire, in every department, in, in 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 time, somebody does the wrong thing, and you try to uncover that right away. And you have to understand the circumstances. Behind, behind all of this, and Tom alluded to it just earlier, this is the age of social media, even though we're not, Tom and I are not tied into it. In four years, not one piece of social media has come out, ever. It's almost impossible. That's the greatest hidden thing I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. Uh, if I tonight go somewhere, it'll be on social media that I'm there, uh, within minutes that I'm there, or Tom or anybody else. So for four years, this never happened. All the security people never saw anything. All the managers never saw anything. And where the committee got it wrong is they thought this was a big fraternity, and it's not. It's not at all. This was hidden at the hours of the morning that nobody could possibly find out about. So with that being said, we are embarrassed about what went on, and we're extremely contrite what went on. But that doesn't, one person does not determine the worth of what we're all about as a program. Because we do it the right way, we do the right things. And leaders, going forward to answer this gentleman's question, you know, it would be very easy for me to sit up here, and, and I'd be lying to you if I didn't ponder it and say, man, you're 64, why? I, I, I'll, comp I'll finish it, but with this story. I once saw Jimmy Valvano, and this was way before he got sick, and I recommended him for a pro job, and he was going through some tough times at NC State. And then I saw him late, later on, and when he was just about getting sick, I said, Jim, how you feeling? He said, you know, the NCAA invest investigation broke down my immune system. And I always thought about that. And I asked Bobby if that was true, if, if that I remember it the right way. And he said, yes. And believe it or not, it can tear you apart inside and out. That 11-hour meeting, besides everything else, can kill you inside because you know what you stand for and what you believe in. So what do you do? Do you say, let me pack it in like this gentleman alluded to? Uh, let me do something else in life. Let me go. Lead is lead. Uh, I plan on staying here and winning multiple championships, not just one. I plan on going to multiple Final Fours, not just one. And that's what leaders do. They lead the players they're coaching. They're, they 